All right, well maybe I think just for sake of time we should probably get started and uh, I presume we may get some colleagues joining us later, but we'll try to make this so you guys have got a break before your posters and dinner. Posters start at six, I think, and dinner is around that same time, so uh, we wanna make sure you get there in time. Intent is to finish by 5.30 and um, I'll go through this. But the topic I was assigned was uh, diseases of the parathyroids. I'm the president for ASBMR this year, and like you, I started out at about the same age as an endocrine fellow coming to ASBMR with posters and meeting people over time. Um, the reason that this particular meeting, John Belazikian has held together for so many years is because it's a way of encouraging people who don't come from institutions with a lot of bone background or bone people to sort of meet some of the people. And one of the great things about ASBMR meeting is if you go to this for a year or two, you're gonna run into all the people that you care about in your field that are writing, that are, that are publishing, <clears throat> and you get a chance to talk to them. And sometimes that interaction is um, you know, worth the entire registration fee because um, so many good things happen from it. I remember as a fellow standing by my posters and meeting people who came by the poster to see it, some of whom my mentor introduced me to, but others who just came up and I got to know them. And over time, as John said earlier today, I mean, you gain a lot of friends as you go through this, even though people work at different institutions. Um, bone endocrinology is not a huge group around the world, and if you work in the area, you're gonna get to know people very quickly. So, um, <clears throat> things to encourage you about. This um, topic, parathyroid disorders are very important for bone disease. They're you know, critical for uh, many things in the physiology of normal bone turnover and regulation of calcium and <coughs> excuse me, phosphorus, <coughs> as, as well as it's operative in chronic kidney disease and other conditions. So if you have interest in bone, it's hard to get away from PTH. PTH, um, Terry Bolito, who's gonna be um, next year's ASPMR president, has a strong interest in this and in terms of the basic mechanisms and understanding of the action of PTH, and there's a lot of biology behind that, some of which you may have heard about uh, earlier. So we're gonna talk about, um, first of all, the parathyroid disorders overall. We're gonna talk about laboratory and imaging techniques. We'll talk about medical and surgical management options. You'll notice on this faculty program, most of us are MDs. There's, I think Terry might be the only PhD, there might be one other so you're gonna hear more clinical things from us. If you're a PhD and interested in the basics of the research, this background is still helpful at many levels, but at the same time, it may not be directly relevant to what you're doing. And for that, um, you know, if you have questions that you think about or are working on, certainly we can talk about them as we talk about the disorders. So I thought we would start with primary hyperparathyroidism first, because numerically it's the most common. Um, primary hyperparathyroidism is mechanistically thought to result from, in most cases, single adenomas and occasionally, um, here we go, single adenomas and occasionally in about 15% of the time hyperplasia. What drives these disorders is completely separate. And so adenomas, of course, have got genetic mutations, a multitude of them that have been reported not the same in every patient, and why in certain people it's one mutation, others it's another, not clear. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, is thought mechanistically to be due to normal parathyroid glands, but there's more of them, and they're, because of that, they're over-secreting enough parathyroid hormone that it drives the hypercalcemia. Hyperparathyroidism being produced by these overactive glands will stimulate the kidney to stimulate calcium reabsorption from the urine flowing through the kidney, it also stimulates the 1-alpha hydroxylase to produce 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. And then at the same time, there's actions on the bone that generally stimulate increasing bone turnover that leads to bone loss over time. All right, so this is the, you know, three, three separate actions of the hormone on the kidney. Beyond that, we don't want to minimize the fact that there's parathyroid receptors in many tissues in the body that are not classic tissues for action for parathyroid hormone. You know, what parathyroid hormone is doing in the brain, what it's doing in blood vessels, what it's doing in other tissues is not exactly clear. But oftentimes the clinical phenotypes we recognize are not affected by or not, it's not a major issue for some of these other tissues. 
So this is something in your careers as you go forward, if you develop or you develop clinical investigative interest in this, you can sort out the actions of PTH in the liver and muscle and many other things that probably do have a difference and probably are partly behind the symptoms that these patients get because they come usually with a lot of symptoms. Dr. Bilizikian mentioned earlier about the asymptomatic patients, which we classically see in the West now. And as he said, you know, if you ask enough questions, none of them are asymptomatic. They all got symptoms, whether it's due to this or something else, not clear sometimes, but it probably is true that there's more effect of this um, than we think. So the hypercalcemia we think currently is primarily due to the increased skeletal resorption, the increased calcium absorption from the intestine by the production of 125D. 125D, of course, absorbs phosphorus from the intestine as well, but the kidneys get rid of phosphorus, and so because of that, um, you get the, you know, the split in a sense where calcium goes up, phosphorus goes down. Um, skeletal resorption is mainly thought to be due to PTH, but of course, other comorbidities may be affecting the skeleton at the same time, and there's like 35 different conditions that can cause hypercalcemia, separate from PTH. So we've got patients who show up and they've got primary hyperpara, but they've also got hypercalcemia due to sarcoid. And that's a very common combination that I seem to see a lot of patients with. My colleagues do too, and we hear about it from others. But you know, there's many other conditions that can cause hypercalcemia as well. So as endocrinologists, or as you know, if you're seeing patients, you have to keep in mind, you know, we'd like it if Occam's razor was really true and it was only one cause or one thing. But you know, most times it's not, and there's other factors, sometimes more dominant or less dominant, but you can think about these things. The intestinal hyperabsorption is mainly driven by the 125D, and of course, even with all these things going on, if the kidneys could keep up with the filtered load, there wouldn't be hypercalcemia. The problem is, most cases, the kidneys at some point either fail to keep up or just you know, can't excrete enough even when they've got hypercalcuria attached and sometimes significant hypercalcuria, it's just not enough to lower the serum calcium fast enough. Some of the questions we had at the earlier session were all these normal calcemic hyperpara patients, you know, how is that possible? Well, some of those patients, it turns out, have got very high urine calcium, and the reason that they're still normal calcemic is because the kidneys are clearing the calcium as fast as they can, and because they're able to do that, because they don't express the um, phosphate cotransporters that are normally used to reabsorb calcium in the, in the um, urine flowing through the kidney, they get significant hypercalcemia that is actually enough to keep the serum calcium normal. If you block it with a thiazide or something, it solves the urine calcium problem, but then the calcium in the blood goes up. So there's all these things that you have to keep in mind that when you try to treat these patients, you're not hurting anything else at the same time. We briefly mentioned the, the difference between the primary pathophysiology of the adenomas versus hyperplasia. The set point issue has been known for a long time. Ed Brown, who uh, got his professorship at Harvard, discovered this when he discovered the calcium sensing receptor in the early 90s. And he was the one who described the hysteresis curves that talked about a very steep slope in the middle of the physiologic range for calcium as to regulation of PTH. Patients with adenomas, of course, um, had a shift in the curve essentially reflecting the fact that the set point in the calcium sensing receptor made the cells perceive the extracellular calcium to be lower than it really was, and because of that, they secrete more parathyroid hormone. And eventually, you reach a new equilibrium where there's enough PTH driving the calcium high enough that the set point of that calcium sensing receptor says, okay, we're normal. And this is why you establish and maintain the hyperparathyroidism. Um, the hyperplastic cells have a normal set point, interestingly, but they cause the same phenotype. You know, so this is, you know, it's not exactly straightforward. I mean, it took a while to figure these things out. And of course, roughly 15% of our patients have hyperplasia, and it's mainly thought to be due to an increased number of secreting cells as opposed to cells that are less sensitive to circulating calcium. All right. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people develop primary hyperpara. And of course, most of it is parathyroid issues, but of course, there's ectopic PTH like all other hormones that we make. And there's quite a range of different things that secrete ectopic PTH. Um, these are cases where it, the tissue was removed at surgery and then immuno um, um, stained essentially for PTH so that they knew it was PTH secreting. If you ever get a case of somebody who's got an ectopic PTH secreting tumor, if it comes out, make sure you talk to the surgeon to make sure they send some of it 
or preserve some of it in such a way that you can do immunohistochemistry later because the journals will not accept case reports anymore without that information. And so, you know, this is an easy journal publication if you come across something like that. Adenomas or lipoadenomas are, you know, variations on a theme. The lipoadenoma is usually seen in older patients who acquire fat in the parathyroid glands as we age. Younger people have got very fat less parathyroid glands. Older folks have got more fat in there. It's not clear what the fat does exactly, but with all the crosstalk between fat and bone and fat and everything else, there's got to be effects. It's not really clear yet uh, based on that. Parathyroid hyperplasia, we've mentioned. Parathyroid carcinomas are rare, less than 1% of cases uh, in the series that are done, um, but they're real and they're significant. And the problem is by the time they're recognized, many times they're metastatic and it's very hard to cure. And so the managing of those patients is more or less maintaining, not trying to get cure, but um, they're difficult patients to take care of because as you go along, there's less and less solutions and eventually there is no more solutions. And they'll die of hypercalcemia eventually. So um, the spectrum of this, we talk a lot about sporadic because clinically what we see is most people have no family history of anything. Um, there's the familial forms, of course, and about 8% of patients in different syndromes. Um, in the sporadic form, most of the patients showing up these days are asymptomatic, like John said, because they don't really complain of the classic symptoms of fatigue, neurocognitive dysfunction, or musculoskeletal pain. They have other symptoms, and sometimes as you ask them more, the more questions you ask, the more you discover they're not really asymptomatic, but they, they seem to be asymptomatic for the classic symptoms. Symptomatic patients, uh, probably a third of the patients we see coming in are symptomatic enough to recommend surgery up front. The other two thirds, at least at our institution, we manage these people by monitoring over time. And of course, some of these people are being followed for 30 to 50 years with no change in their calcium or PTH. The long-term data from Shawnee Silverberg studies published in the New England Journal here a few years ago uh, from Columbia, they, they found about 27% of their patients over 15 years developed a reason for surgery when they didn't have it at the beginning. And so this has evolved over time and you know, it's a clinical judgment what you do. The acute forms are uncommon, of course, but the highest calcium ever reported to occur in a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism was a patient who walked in the door at the emergency department at Columbia in New York with a serum calcium of 26. And the guy was alive, cognitively not impaired and able to walk under his own power. How long he would have done that is not clear, but that's what they got. So that case has been widely reported and Dr. Belazikian was the mentor of the, my mentor who became um, you know, my faculty member um, when she was a resident. So this is how these things happen. The neonatal forms are generally severe, generally lead to operation within a first day or two of life because these guys are at high risk. They all have um, you know, cystic, um, uh, significant skeletal changes. Some have fractures in utero or during birth and their serum calciums are 13 and higher. So they're, they're acutely affected and they're severely ill. And in most cases, if you don't operate within the first week of life, they're gonna die. So that, that's the spectrum. Um, the normal calcemic version seems to be becoming more common or at least more recognized. And that's, I think, largely driven because in the osteoporosis workup, looking for secondary causes, PTH is almost always measured. And with that, of course, you find out a fair number of people have got slightly high PTH and then they refer for indications trying to figure out why it is. But that version seems to be fairly common. The spectrum of normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism I don't think is monolithic. I think it's a, a variety of cases. Just physiologically, you can see normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism if you have vitamin D deficiency, if you have suboptimal calcium intake or absorption through diet or supplements, or if you have undetected or not yet known um, idiopathic hypercalcuria. Any one of those will create the phenotype of normal serum calcium, generally with some, some being lower, some being mid-normal, and then hyperpara that's usually in the range that patients are worried because it's high enough and they, they don't know that it's relatively mild as we, as we look at this. But, they're concerned. And then um, the question is what to do, and it's hard to reassure patients who still wonder why their par parathyroid hormone is 84 and not 65, like all their friends, you know, and this, this creates a problem. So the syndromes, um, you know, it's usually MEN1, everybody knows hyperparathyroid can present first, but then the other things, pituitary pancreatic issues show up later, 
if, if you're not looking for them. Um, most of the time, if a patient is less than 35 and they show up with hyperparathyroidism, I'm screening for MEN1 to make sure that they, we're not missing hypercortisolemia or hyperprolactinemia or um, in other cases, hypergastrinemia. So that, that spectrum is out there. MEN2 is more symptomatic usually and, and more easily recognized. The hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome, these people show up usually with a jaw tumor first, not recognized to have hyperpara, and then the hyperpara is recognized later in, you know, several years later in most cases, mostly in young adults, teenage to early 20s. Familial isolated primary hyperparathyroidism, these are people who sort of have the same genetic mutations that lead to MEN1, but they never get the associated pituitary or pancreatic neoplasms. Not clear why, but the same mutations. And I've got people, you know, like I said, is this real? I've got people that have got familial isolated primary hyperpara over three generations that I've, you know, been followed and never ever has gotten into trouble with later in life pituitary or pancreatic issues. So that spectrum is out there as well. Biochemically, what we expect to see in these people is high normal to increase serum calcium, low normal to decrease serum phosphorus, and then inappropriately normal or increased intact parathyroid hormone. That's the spectrum. It used to be that you had to have high calcium, low phosphorus, and PTH to make the diagnosis. But the problem is, as more testing has been done, our labs are better, um, more things are being checked, we're finding a spectrum that was not recognized, you know, a generation ago anyway. So. That's the issues. Um, not commonly measured or specifically measured for this purpose for diagnosing is other things that oftentimes show up. So we see a lot of people who've got increased total alkaline phosphatase driven by the high PTH simulating osteoblasts that make more bone alkaline phosphatase. The total goes up. And we have a lot of our clinicians who go, you know, why is that? Well, what, you know, it's sort of overlooked because they can't easily explain it. They know it's not liver, so it's gotta be bone but nobody really thinks further. But it's very common in this disorder to have it, like it's very common to have increased bone-specific alkaline phosphatase if you measure it, or serum CTX, because they all go up, all right? Um, calcium to creatinine clearance ratios, there's been a lot made by Steve Marks at the NIH about this in the past. There was a time, uh, even during my fellowship years, where it was said if it's above 0 0.01, um, it's gotta be hyperpar, and if it's below that cutoff, it's gotta be FHH. As you know, uh, cases don't follow the guidelines and uh, there's overlap and uh, all that. There's been some discussion of replacing that ratio with other better things, but there's nothing by consensus yet that's been agreed to. So a high urine calcium is meaningful. The problem is some of these patients have got mid-normal or slightly high calciums and then it's harder to know. But it's still one of the um, surgical indications if you find high urine calcium. Increased 125D driven by the PTH action on the 1-alpha hydroxylase, you expect that. But a lot of people, when they see the high 125D, they're going, does this mean there's a second cause here? And it's always a matter of degree. How high is the 125D? The high, if the 125D is significantly increased, I'd say that's not what we expect with hyperpara. It may be sarcoid or granulomatous or something other causing that. At the same time, you've got the hyperpara, okay? The people who get these overlap or two syndromes or two disorders causing the same syndrome tend to have numbers that don't quite add up. They're, they're more severe than they should be or the levels are not as high as they should be for just one of the conditions. So that's how we oftentimes suspect they might have a second cause. One of the ladies I saw this summer actually had three separate causes. I didn't expect that, but she had pretty high calcium. Turned out she was vitamin A toxic, she was vitamin D toxic from the sarcoid that she didn't know she had at the time, and she had primary hyperpara. So you find these people, and if you don't look, you're surprised when you find it. So keep an open mind about this. I tend to, you know, when we're suspecting it's primary hyperpara, you limit your evaluation because you don't need to know vitamin A levels or vitamin D levels specifically. But um, in this case, if, if things don't add up completely, you know, it's worth checking to see just in case. So. What's known about this worldwide? Bill Frazier, who's from the UK, uh, wrote a very nice paper in the Lancet. Bill comes to the ASBMR. If you go to the poster sessions, you're likely to run into him and you can ask him questions about you know, this paper that he wrote. So um, the view of this is that really this is still the most common cause for outpatient hypercalcemia. Inpatient hypercalcemia classically is due to malignancy, usually in the last three months of life. And this is kind of a fact that's oftentimes lost. And so people in the hospital who are not on death's doorstep Many times they got hypercalcemia and everybody says, well, it's gotta be the malignancy and it turns out it's not. It's milk alkali syndrome, it's other things, 
you know, that nobody had found out before. It's the third most common endocrine disorder after diabetes and hypothyroidism. So it's more common than osteoporosis, it turns out. The incidence figures, you can see they're relatively common in US and uh, European populations, different elsewhere in the world. Prevalence is about two to three out of a thousand women. So one out of 500 women get this. Whenever I talk to patients about this and I tell them it's that common, they're going like, I've never known anybody who's had this. Nobody in my family, none of my friends, nobody on my block ever had this, but you know, it's, it's that common. One out of a thousand men, so women are twice as effective as men, not clear why, it's gotta be hormonal, but even with all the research on this, there's no answer to that. So if you were looking at, you know, what's the difference for this, you know, dimorphism in a sense, it's not clear, but that would be a study worth doing. The um, prevalence figures that are quoted are usually based on multi-channel analyzer data. When those started coming out in the mid 70s, all of a sudden we realized that unlike what Fuller Albright saw in the 30s at MGH, it wasn't just people with severe kidney stones and severe osteoporosis and dying horrible deaths after multiple fractures and height loss like Captain Martell that was shown in some of the slides from Dr. Uh, Bill Ezekian's talk after lunch. It turned out a lot of people have got slightly high calcium, slightly high PTH, and it wasn't recognized up until the mid 70s that that was the case. So this is something that's within a generation of you not even being realized because the perception of the disease was quite different. You know, um, It's diagnosed at all ages, like we said earlier, most frequently in about the sixth decade, female to male ratio three to one, and it's most frequently found in postmenopausal women Back in the day when we used to use estrogen to treat symptoms in postmenopausal women, commonly women would come off estrogen at the right age for the right reasons, and the next year their calcium is now 11.0, whereas last year it was 9.5. And that is lost on people because you know we're not seeing it as much anymore, but estrogen has a direct suppressive effect on skeletal release of calcium independent of the PTH level. So this is like estrogen acting as an anti-resorptive agent blocking calcium release from the skeleton into the circulation. You stop your estrogen, the blood calcium goes right back up where it should have been without the estrogen. And so if you see that happening, it's not a big surprise. Most of those people had previously undetected primary hyperpara because it wasn't that severe. So what about more recent data? Um, Michael Yeh, who's one of the Orthopedic surgeons at UCLA did a very nice study looking at the Kaiser Permanente Southern California database. This is an insurance database with large numbers of patients. They screened that database for patients that they thought would meet criteria for hyperparathyroidism, so serum calcium above 10.5, and excluded secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And out of the 3.5 million enrollees, they found about 15,000 who had high serum calcium in the range they were looking for, and of those, 87% had primary hyperpara by the current diagnosis uh, definition. It's interesting that the highest incidence was seen in blacks and whites, and this shows their important data, which says, you know, this in fact, most of us, I think, you know, if we see hyperpara patients, we're not using to think that this is more common in blacks, but it is, at least in Southern California, and by a fair amount, it turns out. Asians, Hispanics, whites, all others are kind of in there. Um, at about the same level, but blacks are noticeably more affected by this in the women. And the next slide shows the same data for men. And of course, it's similar patterns. And of course, it's worse in the 80 years and up range, but also affected at different levels at younger ages. So this is the best data we have right now on um, multiple ethnicities being affected by the same disorder. The etiology underlying eventually is really unknown in most cases, or it's not taken time to figure it out because it doesn't matter so much. You take out the tumor if you have to and treat it otherwise if you need to. So the only thing ever reported in the history of the literature on this is that in occasional cases, people had had external neck radiation, external beam radiation, usually 20 or 30 years earlier for head or neck cancers. So you can see why they would get it because we expect thyroid nodules, we expect you know, scar tissue in the chest, we expect other things, but this is the only thing that's ever been reported. Most people who show up, of course, have never had that, but we always ask because you never know. In the Chicago area in the 1950s, they were using radiation to treat things like acne, tonsils, and thymus enlargement, and we still see a fair number of patients from the Chicago area who show up, and that's their external neck radiation 50 years ago, 40 years ago, depending on the age at which they got it. Most of these tumors 
adenomas in particular will have genetic abnormalities. And this summarizes sort of what's been reported over time. There's multiple different genetic causes identified. Um, the society has had a number of people who focused on genetic causes for tumors and trying to identify what the mutations were. And of course, some of the things that you might expect, like calcium sensing receptor mutations are rare. Um, other things that turned out one of the more common causes seems to be the PRAD1, CCND1 overexpression with a translocation, and that drives the development of tumors. But other things are not quite so clear. The MEN1 uh, tumor mutations, tumor suppressor mutations, have also been reported in this, and yet the majority of those do not develop um, certainly cancer or hyperplasia, like you might expect. So there's some um, discrepancies in there not yet fully worked out. Beta-catenin signaling has been found in this, and that, as you might expect from the bone talks, would drive bone formation. It's being used, manipulated by some of our therapeutic agents for osteoporosis treatment. Well, these guys have had increased WINT-B and beta-catenin signaling. So things to uh, be aware of, and like I said, it's all over the map in terms of what's underlying this. The skeletal effects, which, you know, like I said, back in Fuller Albright's day, it was like everybody had terrible osteoporosis, terrible fractures, terrible kidney stones. Nowadays, it's about 5% who have evident bone disease. Most of these will have osteoporosis, but if you look at the classic findings, Osteitis fibrosis cystica by x-rays, usually bone tumors or bone cysts that show up on skeletal surveys or bone scans sometimes. Salt and pepper skull, if you get skull films or subperiosteal resorption of the phalanges on hand films, we hardly ever get those anymore, but that was the old way of diagnosing hyperpara because those were the sites in the skeleton where things happened and it was discovered through experience. That was a, a very big tip off for the diagnostic pattern, especially before we had PTH assays in the early 70s. We, we couldn't assay PTH before about 1972. And of course, that makes it very hard to diagnose a condition that's characterized by high PTH because you can't find the molecule that you're looking for. Distal resorption of clavicles, of course, that's a board question. You, know, you should think of hyperpair with that. And the last line is something you know, we don't see in our clinics usually, but if a patient shows up and they've got dental films and the dentist says, you know, there's loss of this lamina densa, one of the membranes around the teeth, that's virtually pathognomonic for this condition. So on a board question, if they ask you that, the answer should be primary hyperparathyroidism as the cause if that is presented to you, all right? So this shows a bone scan in a patient with primary hyperpara. And what you notice is you've got asymmetric hot spots in a variety of places around the skeleton. Some are in the ribs, some are in the long bones, et cetera. Uh, many patients see this, commonly orthopedic surgeons see this, and they're worried about metastatic cancer of some type. In that case, they're oftentimes not gonna do surgery, but they're gonna refer to either medical oncology or sometimes um, the uh, endocrinologist because they're worried somebody knew they also had high calcium. So high calcium and metastatic lesions like this make orthopedic surgeons very worried. One of the things about this that I wanna point out is that you look at the skull and the skull has notably got increased uptake relative to the rest of the skeleton. That pattern is classic for primary hyperpara. And radiologists, when they see this on a bone scan, that pattern, they'll oftentimes say, looks like metabolic bone disease, which in their mind means primary hyperpara mostly. But that's something that if you see that, that's a pretty classic finding as well. So complications other than skeletal, um, we know that kidney stones can occur, nephrocalcinosis too, renal insufficiency, more common than the skeletal disorders these days, generally. Um, and then um, hypercalcaria, if you look for it, it's up to 30% of patients. So that's a fairly common finding, but not 100%. So it's not everybody's got hypercalcaria. A lot of these patients will have serum calcium levels between say 150 and 300, slightly higher at the upper normal, some are higher, but occasional patients will have levels of 600, 800, or even higher. Symptoms, um, if you ask enough about what symptoms the patient might have, everybody has something. So you could be fooled into thinking that maybe their symptoms are due to this, or at least complicated by it. And sometimes, of course, you really can't tell and because they're so symptomatic and complaining of that, well, if you fix this, sometimes it helps them, sometimes not. Um, cardiovascular issues and gastrointestinal issues, these are relatively rare in, the, in North America these days. In Europe, where patients are oftentimes screened later and picked up later, they have more valvular 
calcifications and uh, coronary artery calcifications than what we seem to see in the US. But it's a spectrum, and again, in countries where it's picked up late or it's very severe, certainly you, you could expect it may accelerate some of those things. Pancreatitis is virtually never seen anymore, but back in the 50s, it was a fairly common association. So when we see pancreatitis in these days with hypercalcemia or hyperparatached, our first question is what else is causing the pancreatitis? But sometimes the GI folks can't come up with anything and maybe it is this. And so in these cases, they tend to benefit from parathyroidectomy. So medical management, um, surgery has been the mainstay for many years, but of course people always you know, find patients who don't want surgery, can't take surgery, refuse surgery, and then you're stuck with what, what we can do to modulate this. And so the key things are, you know, oral hydration, obviously avoiding thiazides makes sense. Calcium intake that's in the range of what's normally recommended for postmenopausal women is reasonable because small amounts of calcium intake, less than 600 milligrams a day, generally stimulates parathyroid oversecretion. And if most North Americans are consuming diets that have between about five and 600 milligrams of calcium, we're all living on the edge. And this is why when people are screened for various other disorders, they come up with hyperparathyroidism. Well, it's not primary hyperparathyroidism, it's suboptimal calcium intake because they're getting 300 or 400 milligrams a day. Estrogen or raloxifene, if they're used for treating osteoporosis, that certainly brings it down and doesn't have long-term consequences, but there's so much risk attached that not commonly done, or at least not for very long. You can use bisphosphonates in a pinch because you can shut off skeletal release of calcium by giving any of the bisphosphonates. Longer term IV bisphosphonates are more potent that way, but uh, it's the same reason that it works for hypercalcemia malignancy. Calcium emetics, um, Cinecalcet right now is the only um, current um, calcium emetic that we use in endocrinology. There's another one that's been approved, etylcalcetide for nephrologists during dialysis treatments. We don't use that very much in a pinch, I suppose you could, but oftentimes uh, your pharmacy you know, may say something about it if you prescribe it as an endocrinologist and not a nephrologist because they know what the indication is. Non-calcemic D analogs could be used in certain cases like they use them in nephrology to try to control hypercalcemia and hyperparathyroidism. They're not very effective, but they could be used. And then of course there's older agents like calcitonin, plecomycin, gallium nitrate that have been used. And in severe cases, of course, you could still do hemodialysis acutely with a low or zero calcium dialysate bath if you had to, if they were in crisis, parathyroid crisis. Most of the time, you're sort of stuck between some of these, not working very well, but it's better than nothing. And so oftentimes that's what's done. So um, how good is Senecalcet? Monroe Peacock, who I actually walked across the street with this morning, coming to the convention center, he published this in the next paper that looked at the effect of this across a spectrum of primary hyperparathyroidism, showing that it works and it's effective and it worked for up to 4.5 years in this paper. And you know, essentially how much was it? Well, it was actually fairly effective getting the calcium levels down. Serum PTH comes down but doesn't normalize. So even though the Cinecalcid is a calcium sensing receptor modulator and it fools the parathyroid cells into thinking calcium levels in the blood are higher than they actually are, and because of that the PTH levels shut off or decrease, it's rare to get them to come down to normal. So they tend to stay high, all of that. Um, bone density changes did not change during the long-term follow-up. So even though you controlled the hyperparathyroidism, it didn't help your bone disease, apparently. And um, the conclusion of this was it's equally effective in medical management of different types of parathyroid disorders across the spectrum. And it's also at the same time with other papers being published around the same time, it's approved for treating parathyroid cancer as well, because it works in that. Um, how long it works, the longest studies we have with Cinecalcid are five years. I've got patients right now, several of them that are now up to eight to nine years of continuous therapy and so far they're tolerating it, responding well, not having side effects, but there's no data beyond five years. So you can use this. The problem is most times eventually the glands will grow enough that you can see them and take them out. In these patients that I'm talking about, they, their imaging is still negative after eight or nine years being on Cinecalcid. Okay, so things to think about. The surgical management, um, the surgeons themselves have got guidelines, but there's been um, endocrine and primary care guidelines written. The fourth international workshop held in 2013 is the latest of these. 
Um, there's been four so far. Two of these were sponsored by NIH at the beginning, and then after that it was taken over by other groups. This group uh, was led by Dr. Belazikian at a meeting in Florence, Italy, because the University of Florence sponsored the meeting. So, you know, that's where this comes from. We're due to have a next uh, fifth international workshop, but it's not been announced yet, and I'm not sure funding-wise where that's going to come, but it, it probably will come sometime soon. So the indications for surgery, they said, was symptomatic patients if you're under 50 because of the long-term cost of follow-up. Long-term cost of follow-up, after about seven or eight years, it exceeds the cost of surgery initially, and they say these younger people are going to have to follow forever, and why wait? I mean, why not operate and cure them if you can and be done? Um, serum calcium, more than one milligram per deciliter above the upper limit. Abnormal, either acutely or chronically, that's uh, you know, 11 milligrams per deciliter or higher is the cutoff. If you have evidence of complications, bone loss, osteoporosis for sure. Bone loss in the wrist is more common than it is in the spine or hips. So this is one indication for wrist bone density that insurance will pay for. If you measure wrist in just routine osteoporosis, they're not going to pay for it routinely. So in this case, they know that, and it's been published for quite some time that wrist bone density should be checked in people with primary hyperpara. Kidney stones, if they had them, assuming that they don't have other causes for kidney stones, that's a big issue and sometimes not clear. And you know, if they've got them, we usually use that as ammunition for supporting surgery. And then, of course, these um, psychiatric and um, cognitive issues that commonly are complained of. This shows you a positive Sestamibi scan. The way we do them, because we see so many small adenomas, and they're usually to the side and behind the thyroid gland, and they're washed out by the thyroid uptake, we've done a Sestamibi scan here and then an Iodin-123 scan here that then is subtracted to give these subtraction images, bringing out the less um, noticed or less um, evident parathyroid adenomas. And this works in a lot of cases where home scans were negative just with Sestamibi. We do this other version, and we can find at least half those cases by doing this. Each center has their own preference, and some centers prefer Sestamibi still, some prefer um, 4D CT scan, some centers prefer choline, uh, um, choline 11 PET scans that are now coming online and uh, being available. But the data behind these things, I mean, there have been prospective studies looking at which techniques are better. Dina Elaraj at Northwestern in Chicago did a very nice study comparing neck ultrasound versus negative Sestamibi scans and finding that a fair amount of the time they found it with the neck ultrasound. So that's an option, obviously, that's lower cost, less radiation than a 4D CT scan, but that's an option to consider. Some centers have gone to 4D CT scanning as the preferential test, first line test. Columbia, I understand, has done that, and certain other centers around, but not everybody agrees because this is a big radiation dose. And at least in our hands uh, at Mayo, we don't find this as sensitive as the Sestamibi scan, so we haven't gone to that as the first line test, but it's our third line test if the Sestamibi and neck ultrasound are negative. We think it looks like choline 11 is even more sensitive, so that may be a, an option uh, in the near future. But it can be done as a first line test. And then um, what about post-op treatment results, well, um, Sitges Sierra, who's a very well-known uh, endocrine surgeon in Spain, published this paper that shows bone density increases, as you'd expect, when you're cured. And the issue there was that the bone density increase takes longer than you might expect, and it peaks out at about four years after the surgery if they're cured and they stay cured. So that's the data. Um, there's also been a number of surgical series looking at neurocognitive symptoms, trying to prove that yes, if we do operate on these people, they feel better even if they don't have other complications. And of course, surgeons wanna operate. We're trying to decide should they operate. And our view on this as, as clinicians or um, I would say non-surgical uh, people is usually a little bit more jaundiced than the surgeons. Surgeons are willing to operate on anything but they think they've got some reasons for doing it, and they may be right. I mean, there's a number of series now that have come out showing the same thing, different centers, different authors, but, you know, something to think about. So to wrap this up, um, we realize this is still the most common cause for outpatient hypercalcemia. In Europe and North America, it's generally asymptomatic, but it may be symptomatic in a smaller percentage of patients. If you look at series from across the world, South America, China, Asia, their patients tend to be more symptomatic, whereas China right now is transitioning from being mostly symptomatic to being asymptomatic. 
as economics and other things have changed. Parathyroid hormone can develop in people on thiazides already or lithium. If you have a patient who's on those medications, there's no way biochemically to tell is it side effect of the medication or is it a tumor or hyperplasia. And if you have to know for sure, you gotta stop the medication. In the case of thiazides for about a month is what's normally recommended. With lithium, it's about three months. And of course, the people on lithium, the psychiatrists never wanna stop it because things go haywire when they do. But if you have to know, that's the only way to tell. Parathyroid scans generally are sensitive and historically have been the most sensitive scan in about 90% of cases. Parathyroid ultrasound in our hands is about 70%. Other centers, some better, some worse. 4D CT scans might be helpful if the other imaging is negative. But like I said, other centers believe 4D imaging is better and that's why they do it up front. Surgical criteria still are, depending on this 2013 international workshop, if there is another one, you'll hear about it at some point, and these are consensus guidelines derived by a lot of experts from around the world. Medical management options um, are increasing, but again, they're relatively limited. They don't work very well in a pinch. You can use them, but generally in most cases, if it's symptomatic or bad enough with complications, at least surgery is still preferred, okay? So any questions about this? I mean, this is um, kind of to give you a little bit of background and the implications of some of the stuff you heard today earlier from Dr. Seaman and um, um, the other speakers because they kind of covered some of the basics and this is sort of a practic practical application of all those things, sort of explaining why we see certain things. But any questions about this or you know the things that we mentioned? Because some of you I, I know are from overseas things are different and maybe you don't do it this way and that's okay. Um, one thing, you know, bone disease, there's many ways to skin a cat. We all agree, some ways better, some ways maybe not so good. Each people, each physician does this on their own when they make these decisions and you know, you live by your consequences. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you learn over time certain things maybe are not better done and that sort of thing. It's, it's hard to have somebody giving dogmatic statements about this or that because every situation is different. So any questions about any of this so far? I have a quick question. Yeah? I wonder how possible that there's, there's more than four digits. Well, yeah, so it's a big issue because it's a more expensive test. Choline 11, by the way, is even more expensive, like five times more expensive. So the issue is, um, if you have to know, and the option is to operate blindly, which many endocrine surgeons are willing to do, but in the right setting only, most of the time they prefer not because it's a longer operation and higher risk and all that. Um, so the thought is, if we have a test that's effective at finding these things most of the time, you know, cost is an issue too, but it's like you're gonna operate and maybe leave the patient with one gland in that you couldn't find, and then they've got scar tissue and they're gonna have to go back for surgery later you trade those risks off to a slightly higher, slightly more expensive test with more radiation, et cetera, contrast as well. And then, you know, you gotta make your choice. So I think um, in the old days, you know, all of our surgeons did three inch incisions and spent two hours looking at all four glands and taking out the one or ones that were bigger than they should have been. Nowadays, nobody wants to tie up the ORs for that long because that's a long operation. Plus, you know, anesthesia risk and other risks for the patients, they get DVTs and all the rest. So there's a lot of um, hesitancy about you know, just operating blindly. Sometimes you have to because you can't find it otherwise. And most times they get in there. I mean, the cure rates around the world are still 95 to 98% with first time operations, no matter how they're done. But you know, it's some, you're, you're pay, taking certain risks and it takes longer to do certain surgeries. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, well, so you'd have to look at, I, Colum, is anybody here from Columbia? Because, so do you know what the current figure quoted for sensitivity is? Okay. All right, so you probably w didn't work with a group that does all that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not a huge percent increase. And so, I mean, if, you know, if sesamibi is like 90% in first operations, you know, I think they would say it's probably 92 or 94 or something like that. It's not like 100%. But they, you know, and they looked at this very carefully and kind of ran everybody through all three techniques and then compared, they said, Sestamibi, it looked like in the series they had, found it more often. You know, and that's an important finding. Other centers have done similar studies and didn't find the same finding. <laughs> so this is where, you know, 
each center is different. They do things in a way, and it works for them, and that's okay. You know, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so less commonly than we used to. Part of that is it's recognized that it can occur, and of course people before surgery are very keen on replacing adequately the vitamin D and the calcium. In the old days when people had really long-standing disease or very severe disease, and when they took it out, of course, the, the bones adapted and took up all the calcium. So nowadays it doesn't happen as often, but occasionally it does, and every now and then you get somebody who's still in the ICU for two weeks after surgery getting IV calcium as fast as you can give it, and then transitioning eventually to the oral because it, it's harder, um, but it's not very common, you know. So, but that's kind of where we're at, and there's been a lot of ways trying to fix that. I think right now the most popular ways are the preemptive intervention before surgery if you can, if you got the time to fix those things, and then things are less severe afterwards usually. Yeah, so I think it partly depends on age of the patient. So if you are at an age where you're likely to be making stomach acid during meals mostly, you could argue you could take it with meals, but a lot of the time in the younger patients, they recommend between meals. If you look at the older patients past age 60 anyway, they make most of their stomach acid with meals. So even though there's other things that buffer the calcium and all that, the tendency is to give the calcium usually um, with meals as patients get older. Some of these people might have, you know, um, achlorhydria and other things that you don't know yet, and that would change things. But with meals in, in the older population is generally used, you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you know, and again, like I said, whatever works for your practice and that's the way it's always worked, that's okay. I mean, there, there's a lot of ways to do this, some, some of which we think are, make more sense. But, again, things that make sense don't always work out either in practice. All right, well, if there's no other burning questions, let's turn to the other side of the coin because this is an area of greater interest now. A lot of new things have developed. There's one new treatment. Uh, the FDA just withdrew Natpara from the market like about 10 days ago because of rubber particles found in the used up cartridges. And the concern is, of course, that somehow either it would block the uptake of the liquid in the very narrow gauge syringes and needles that are being used Otherwise, um, nobody wants injecting rubber particles under your skin repeatedly anyway. And it's not yet clear why this occurred or if it was an all doses seen because the FDA withdrew all doses, 25, 50, 75, and 100 microgram doses. And now, right now, what's happening is this week and next, people are running out of their cartridges of what they had before the withdrawal. So we're expecting you know, people to be hospitalized, people to crash. I mean, all these things can happen if they're very dependent on PTH. And having managed in my own practice before PTH became available, sometimes using even um, teriparatide at that time because we had nothing else, versus what it's been for the last two and a half years having had PTH 184, it's been night and day different. I mean, it's hugely different and the patients are much better, they're more functional, all that, even though the drug is ridiculously expensive. So these are things that you have to decide, is it bad enough to need? At the end of this talk, we'll talk about what the guidelines say currently and what the recommendations are. Um, classic findings of hypocalcemia, of course, Chivostec sign is one of them, and this is fairly common. Everybody knows this from medical school days on. It's a classic finding, but roughly 10 to 15% of the general population has this finding even without hypopara or hypocalcemia. So again, it's not pathognomonic, but it's a good sign. Trousseau sign, of course, everybody knows that from medical school days as well. The issue here is that when you raise the blood pressure cuff, usually at least five millimeters above systolic pressure, and you wait for three minutes, things become hypoxic and hypoxic muscles cramp. When they cramp, they go into tetany. And this hand looks like the way it does because that is a severe muscle cramp that the patient cannot straighten out. And when a person's like that, almost always it's gonna take IV calcium and an ER visit to fix that because it's so severe. And in most cases, these patients are you know, they're crying because it's that severe, and the problem is, you know, a lot of times you, you hear this or you see, you see it being demonstrated, sometimes repeatedly in the same patient to show medical students. The patients really hate that, and the problem is once it happens and you do this to them once, they rarely will trust you to do it again because they know what's going to happen. 
And I, when I was a fellow, I had one of the patients with hypopara, uh, one of our faculty showed them on the same patient more than once, and the patient ended up chasing the consultant out of the room because they were so upset and you know, wanted to kill the guy. So it's a painful sign, but when you see it, you know, it's a strong suggestion. This, on the other hand, is not pathognomonic either because about 1% to 2% of the population will do this if you try it. So it's not only hypopara patients. But classic medical teaching, you know, th these are things from the past. Cardiac manifestations are fairly common, so of course long QT intervals are classic for hypocalcemia, hypopara being one of the causes. Michael Manstadt from Harvard, who's at this meeting, I saw him yesterday, published this on one of his patients who came to the ER with a calcium of 7.3, normal range being about you know, 8.5 to 10.5, low enough that they had prolongation of the QT interval, and the QT interval goes from essentially the Q wave to the end of the T wave, and so that interval is what we're really talking about. Down here, of course, it's shorter because they had replaced the calcium enough to get the calcium up to 9.2. So if you see that, that's again a pretty um, classic finding, not pathognomonic either because low magnesium and low phosphorus and low potassium and other things can do the same thing. But if you see it, it's a pretty good tip off, okay? Um, Michelle Rubin from Columbia has done bone biopsies on patients with hypopara, comparing them to normal age match controls. If you look at the osteoporosis literature, you'd say, well, clearly that's the treated patient who's doing well and this one over here has got osteoporosis. I mean, that's the classic thing they show you in the ads. Well, of course, in this case, this was the healthy control, and that was the hypopara patient, because these people get dense bone, plate-like bone, not so rod-like in the trabecular bone, and when they do the um, scanning EMs on the trabecular bone biopsies, this is what they actually show. So dense bone, heavy bone, it's gonna raise bone density. The big mystery still is, even with that increased bone density, does it prevent fractures? Studies show varying findings. So in some studies they say, yes, there seems to be less fractures. Other studies show more fractures. And of course, the properties of bone, if you increase density enough, it becomes more brittle. If it's in the right range, it's strong. If it's lower mineral content, then of course it's gonna be weak. And so there's a spectrum there. And where they are on that spectrum, you know, sort of I think determines what their fracture risk will be. Bone markers are suppressed, not in the basement, you look at the Z-scores, minus two is about you know, what most of them had, CTX a little bit less. And then of course for bone density, we're seeing Z-scores that are somewhere between upper limit of normal and maybe two standard deviations above normal. These are not people who get Z-scores of plus 11 or plus eight or seven like you sometimes see with hyperdense bone that's due to other causes. But these people have slightly increased bone density and theoretically at least could have stronger bone. The genetic forms of hypoparathyroidism tend to cause dental enamel hypoplasia, tend to cause cataracts. Cataracts, in this case, are mostly what they call posterior subcapsular cataracts. There's many kinds of cataracts, and of course, without a slit lamp exam, you can't tell either. So the ophthalmologists do this day in and day out, and they, they know right away what's going on. Um, posterior subcapsular cataracts are classic for this condition. So if you get a board question, the answer would be not age-related cataracts, it'll be posterior subcapsular cataracts. The basal ganglia calcifications can range from punctate to more extreme measures, and of course there's a range of that. Um, something like 60 to 70% of these patients will have evidence of basal ganglia calcification if you do a CT or MRI. The recommendations right now don't say routinely do it unless they have symptoms. So, you know, a lot of these people never had a CT or an MRI because we don't know. Differential diagnosis, it's largely a post-surgical condition, but there's autoimmune, there's iron, there's copper overload, metastatic disease, radioactive iodine therapy, and magnesium deficiency or excess. So when you see a patient for the first time with hypopara who does not have a scar on the anterior neck, you should think, why else would this patient have this if they've never had anterior neck surgery? And of course, then you gotta check some of these things. The one thing that most of us would not routinely measure is the magnesium, and yet magnesium definitely determines whether you can release PTH or not. If you're hypermagnesemic or hypomagnesemic enough, you can't release PTH, and you get the biochemical picture of hypoparathyroidism. So you can treat patients for hypoparathyroidism never having checked magnesium and not realizing it was a magnesium-wasting disorder in their kidney that caused the biochemical phenotype that you're seeing. So you, you just have to remember, check magnesium if you see a patient with what looks like hypoparathyroidism.
So what about these various uh, things? What do we know about post-surgical hypoparathyroidism? Well, if you've had anterior neck surgery, it's the most common cause for this. Most of these are due to damage to the glands or removal of the glands by mistake, not on purpose. Um, but yet, you know, you, you see patients who said their surgical specimen was examined extensively after surgery and there's no parathyroid glands attached or inside and they left glands in and yet in spite of that, they still became hypopara. I constantly hear from patients that the surgeon before they closed up visualized good blood flow and normal color glands in the neck and of course within a day or two of closing up, they became hypopara permanently in a lot of cases. So why the damage occurs is not still clear. But permanent hypoparathyroidism is generally considered to be longer than six months. So if it's less than that, they still might recover. And that's an important thing to tell patients when they're severely hypopara right after surgery, because sometimes they do recover. Um, the estimates of how common this is for permanent hypoparathyroidism, 0.5 to 6.6 .6 in different series percentage-wise, more common in less experienced centers, less common in more experienced centers, Endocrine surgery centers tend to have lower figures, but not zero. So even excellent endocrine surgeons occasionally can cause this for whatever reason. If you look at transient hypoparathyroidism, it turns out figures are as high as 50% of patients will have hypopara the next day. We're not routinely screening for it, usually unless they become symptomatic, but there's a lot of these patients who have transient hypoparathyroidism that recovers, and yet we're not even aware of it. They're not aware of it but the studies when they do it sequentially and uh, you know, by protocol, they find it. It's higher risk if you've got bigger operations, reoperations, more extensive thyroid surgery, substernal goiters, cancer, or Graves disease if you're operating for those reasons. This shows the pattern of recovery of PTH after neck surgery. What you notice is the patterns are similar to post-operative diabetes insipidus that you see in the ICU. And of course, the classic teaching is some are maybe lower than they should be, but they recover fully. Others are low at the start, and then over time they either recover partially, sometimes fully, or sometimes not at all. Same pattern, same case uh, descriptions of people who do this after surgery when they look at this from a surgical series. Most of the recovery, though, will occur in that first 28 days, but occasionally you get further improvement in some of the situations, but you can also have further loss in other situations. So this is why if you're gonna follow these people, probably checking at a month time point, is reassuring if they're back to normal. If they're not, I would say check them again at six months to see if they did recover, because sometimes they do, many times they don't. What about ways of trying to mitigate the risk of post-operative hypoparathyroidism? Well, the um, surgeons decided that maybe if we measured parathyroid hormone during surgery, that would help, because of course, in a lot of these cases, they were taking out more glands, and the question was, when do we stop? Because if we can't tell PTH during the surgery, you're guessing. And you know, a lot of times the surgeons would take out more than they should have. So in our own institution, Melanie Richards, one of the surgeons, looked at this in two different eras before and after the interoperative PTH assay became available, and you see the difference in terms of the hypoparathyroidism occurrence. No change in recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, and also no change in the cure, but a big difference in terms of post-operative hypoparathyroidism. The problem with this is, I mean, there's still a lot of centers in the U.S. that don't use post-operative, or I should say intraoperative PTH, and many centers overseas don't even have it. It's an expensive assay to do, and it takes a lot of infrastructure to do it, and so a lot of places just don't have resources. But if you have it, it's a good idea. Um, what about some of these non-surgical causes? Well, you know, there's certain things known about these. The autoimmune hypoparathyroidism we typically think will be either APS1, usually in pediatric patients again to start, sometimes isolated, sometimes autoimmune occurs in adults that are isolated, don't have other features, you know, and it's said to be the second most common cause of hypoparathyroidism in adults, but iron overload, copper overload, and occasionally radioactive iodine therapy for thyroid disease, cancer especially, but sometimes graves, you can give enough that it will damage the glands and occasionally with metastatic infiltration. The metastatic infiltration generally has to have at least 90% of the parathyroid tissue knocked off to become hypopara. So, you know, a half a gland is enough to keep you out of trouble otherwise. And then this magnesium deficiency, like I said, we see it commonly with PPI therapies for GERD and stomach acid. Um, the, the likeliest scenario for excess would be tocolytic therapy during pregnancy and delivery, and that's you know, still used a fair amount 
in various places. So what about um, some of these genetic causes? APS1 has a lot of information behind it because the Scandinavians have had a long standing interest in this. They know that uh, autosomal recessive mutations in the air gene are what's causing this and they associate other autoimmune conditions with it. And then there's different estimates that have been made by different countries around the world and so it ranges from very common in Iranian Jews to less common in northern Italians. And it's quite a spectrum that's largely, again, genetic. Um, if you look at the spectrum of these other things, you see that the candidiasis is said to be the most common, and then hypopara, the next thing, Addison's the third thing, other things that follow. Um, this is looking at Finnish patients in a New England Journal paper from a few years ago, but this is not different nowadays, it's about the same. For other genetic causes, um, we know that autosomal dominant familial hypocalcemia can occur. In this case, there is activating mutations on the calcium receptor, not inactivating mutations like we talked about before. Um, this may be, it's thought, maybe among the different genetic causes, this may be one of the most common, it turns out. But DeGeorge syndrome occurs for other reasons, TBX1 and other mutations. And then, of course, there's other ones that affect pre-pro-PTH and other, other signaling molecules that are affected that cause dysgenesis of the glands, and because of that, they don't make PTH. GCMB is one example of that. GCM2 is the uh, um, similar molecule. And then, of course, there's syndromic forms that cause deafness, renal anomalies. That's the GATA3 mutations. Um, there's SOX3 mutations that are reported. There's tubulin binding mutations that occur that leads to a syndromic form of various things. Again, most of these causes would be diagnosed in childhood or infancy because they're not going to make it to, ch to adulthood sometimes or they're long ago diagnosed. I've actually met patients at the Hypoparathyroidism Association in the U.S. with GATA3 mutations, and just like they say, they've got deafness, they've got renal anomalies, and they've got hypoparathyroidism. Harder to control than sometimes the post-surgical patients, but very nice people, you know, like, like you'd expect. Um, Diagnosing this condition is sort of the opposite of the previous. I won't take time to go through this. Same comment about all these other things. Alkaline phosphatase tends to be low. This is not hypophosphatasia causing low alkaline phosphatase. It's hypoparathyroidism causing low alkaline phosphatase. So again, when you see these patients and they've got biochemical abnormalities you're trying to figure out, you got to keep your thinking caps on and not automatically assume that it's the d disease of the day because we're hearing a lot more about hypophosphatasia and the treatments for that. Um, how common is this? In the U.S., they've done very large uh, insurance database searches, and in this one study, uh, Powers et al., there was like 77 million patients they had in the database. This combined data from 75 different health plans, and of course, they were able to estimate the number of diagnoses of the condition over 12 months, and then from there, they projected to the U.S. population. They also ran a separate analysis looking at the proportion of neck surgeries resulting in hypoparathyroidism and calculated from there what the estimates were. But the short answer is about 60,000 patients were determined to have hypoparathyroidism in the U.S., and based on the cases they had, they said three-quarters were post-surgical, three-quarters were female, and three-quarters were 45 and up. You know, so that's the current best study on this topic in the U.S. Similar studies have been done elsewhere in other countries. This JCNM paper I was lead author on, but this came out of um, a conference that was held in Florence, Italy, again, looking at hypoparathyroidism. And these were the data that we had at the time. You see many of the Euro Northern European countries have got data. The U.S. has data based on our own estimates from Olmsted County. And then, of course, for incidents, because it's harder, it's you know, less numerically Denmark and India have reported their data, but nobody else has so far. One of the things you notice is surgical hypopara is more common than the non-surgical cases. The next slide will talk about complications because it's just the opposite for complications. The non-surgical forms much more com uh, com um, complicated and the surgical cases less so, so that's interesting. Uh, the Danish data actually showed no increase in mortality for either surgical or non-surgical cases. And they looked at their entire national database. Sweden is doing it right now. I'm going to meet people from the Karolinska at this meeting to talk about their national search and what they're finding and all of that. So there's, you know, further information to come on this, and it's reassuring so far what we have. If you look at the complications that are recognized and you look at the hazard ratios and compare the surgical to the non-surgical, 
cataracts are like roughly four times more common in the non-surgical cases, mostly genetic, than they are in the surgical cases. So things like that you wouldn't automatically assume. You'd think they'd be about the same. Problem is many of the patients with non-surgical uh, hypoparathyroidism had this from the beginning, and by the time they were studied, they were older in life, had had duration of disease for longer, so you might expect some of these things would be higher. But, you know, for example, seizures, sorry, seizures are, you know, definitely more common, tenfold increased risk versus about fourfold increase in the post-surgical cases. And then intracranial calcifications down here, you know, they're up there 60 to 70 percent range, and that's kind of what the best data we have. One interesting thing about this for, cat uh, for fractures, when they looked at the fractures of all fractures, they didn't find a difference between the surgical and non-surgical. When they looked at individual fractures and they looked at all the fractures available for data they had, it turned out that if you were post-surgical hypoparathyroid, you had less upper extremity fractures, so maybe protective perhaps. On the other hand, the non-surgicals had an increased risk of fractures, which makes no sense because of the same disease functionally, but that's the data. So yet to be decided is what is the effect of fracture risk, and it may be that it's not just having hypoparous other things, other factors that maybe make that difference be what it is, but further studies have not been published yet anyway. These patients tend to be anxious. Most of them are anxious because they've had bad experiences with healthcare providers in emergency departments and in clinics where they were ignored, uh, dissed, they were, you know, told they didn't have a disease, it was all in their head and all these other things. And of course, these are people who, you know, they know what they've got because they've dealt with this diagnosis for time and they've seen experts in the past. The problem is the local people don't always know the same things and, you know, they treat them differently. So they're anxious and most of them, um, the next slide shows that many of them are depressed and quality of life overall has decreased worse than if you're hypoparathyroid, than if you're hypothyroid for sure, and it's even worse in various comparative studies, you're down in the range or worse with congestive heart failure. So this is a big impact, and yet these people, when you look at them sitting in front of you, they look pretty normal, they sound pretty normal, and it's hard to believe they've got all these symptoms that they're telling you about, but the studies show the same thing. So I think the challenge as a physician, obviously, is you know we gotta listen to the patients, assume they're right, they're not making it up, and you know, react in a certain way that hopefully is constructive and that builds the relationship over time. How to treat acute symptomatic hypocalcemia. This is old hat stuff. This is Washington Manual things that all of us learned at some point in internship, how to treat. You can treat this condition acutely when it develops by the same things and it works. You give IV calcium, usually calcium gluconate, trying to avoid calcium chloride because it causes you know, if it's extravasated, it'll cause death of tissue and sloughing of tissue, so they don't do that anymore. And then once the infusion is done, then you try to switch them over to an oral calcium and, and magnesium regimen if you need, and eventually get them transitioned and out of the hospital. Not always easy, it's usually a day or two process, even if things go really well. So for chronic hypoparathyroidism, we said at the beginning of the talk, this is more like six months or longer. How do you diagnose it? Well, Maria Luisa Brandi, who was one of the people involved in the meeting in Florence, put this together for JCNM, and you see here what was recommended for diagnosing it. And of course, generally it's the same things that we talked about earlier, but the only difference is chronic hypoparathyroidism is longer than six months duration. The implication of that is when a patient becomes acutely hypoparathyroid in the hospital after surgery and they're in tetany, the way FDA approved NAPARA was for chronic hypoparathyroidism, not acute hypoparathyroidism, and you cannot get that approved insurance-wise for the patient to get them out of the hospital. So this is a big issue and obviously needs to be changed, but that's the way it is. <clears throat> Current guidelines, there's three published. European Society of Endocrinology came out first, August of 2015. Then it was the International Conference, and then the ACE uh, organization has a disease state clinical review, which is not a guideline, but similar. And, you know, they basically concluded the same things. So the treatment targets are shown below, targeting low normal serum calcium, high normal serum phosphorus, 24-hour urine calcium less than 300 milligrams, 7.5 millimoles for SI units, and then a calcium phosphate product less than 55. And everybody says, yeah, that makes sense. That's generally what we try to treat too. Conventional therapy is shown here. It's a combination of things, calcium supplements, obviously, calcitriol, 
because it's activated vitamin D. In the European Union, they have other versions of that that they can use. <coughs> but U.S., it's almost always calcitriol. And then whether you add vitamin D2 or D3 to maintain serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels in the optimal range, most of us feel that that makes sense because some tissues cannot respond to calcitriol. They have to have 25-D uptake and then internal intracellular conversion into 125-D. You only give calcitriol where there's certain tissues in the body that are vitamin D deficient all the time, and that doesn't help. So we usually give both, trying to optimize for age, what the IOM guidelines would say for vitamin D. At this meeting, you're going to hear about vitamin D effects on bone from the Vital D study. Um, Meryl LaBeouf is the, the lead author on that, and she's got, I think, five abstracts at the meeting. And if you want to find out what vitamin D really does, in a very large clinical trial, 20,000 patients followed for five years for multiple outcomes, that will be a definitive answer for some of these things that we hear a lot about in the media and constantly discuss in the medical literature about whether vitamin D does benefit or harm. Thiazide diuretics with a low salt diet can manage hypercalcemia if you have to, and of course phosphate binders or low phosphate diet if you had to. Um, one issue is a lot of our patients can't take thiazide diuretics or they get hypokalemic from it. So usually in that case, if they really are intolerant to these things, you know, sometimes I try to give them 6.25 of hydrochlorothiazide because they might tolerate that. Other times where they really don't, I just put them on a low salt diet. And the low salt diet alone will reduce urine calcium by about 50% in people able to comply with the diet. That's bigger than I think most of us would have thought, but it, it does work if they're in that situation. The guidelines from the European Society, Jens Ballerslev from the University of Norway published this, and you know it's basically the same things. The one difference they added was focusing on long-term well-being and quality of life based on those studies that we showed about anxiety and uh, quality of life issues not being optimal. So they recognized that as an issue. Even if all the other things are met and the bottom one is not, that's an option to use then treatment or moving on to other treatments than the conventional. Dr. Brandy published this list of what was thought to be reasonable indications for using PTH1 to 84 and you know, inadequate serum calcium control using certain doses of vitamin D that are considered excessive or calcium doses more than 2.5 grams a day. Complications, of course, renal-wise if you develop those. Or if you get hyperphosphatemia, you can't control otherwise. PTH-184 will lower serum phosphorus better than anything else you can do. And it's a very nice response and usually works in those people where the, the phosphorus stays high no matter what else you do. Um, the calcium phosphate product we talked about, and then if you've got malabsorption from a G and a GI tract disorder such as celiac disease on top of their bariatric surgery, they're not going to absorb calcium and D no matter what you do, and so that, that was felt to be a reasonable indication. But again, this reduced quality of life is also on that list. How often to monitor, it varies, but the people that are coming off NAPPARA now were writing standing orders for blood calcium checks every two to three days while they're coming off the PTH so they can adjust their calcium and otherwise as quickly as they need to. There's no calcium meters like glucose meters yet, but that's coming. There's developments for that, and that'll be a boon when it comes because then you can do in intensive management change things a lot and possibly use pumps, but without that, it's very hard to do. Urine calcium is usually checked initially and then as clinically indicated. You change your doses of calcium and D a lot, you gotta check the urine calcium because it changes the level, and, but as infrequently as you want to. And then the complications we're screening for, there's no consensus on that yet. Most of us do these things at the baseline and then follow them like every five years if they're normal but there's no, no guideline for how often to check those, but these are what's currently being recommended for the other things. We mentioned at the beginning there's other therapies coming, so it makes sense that you would use PTH or variants thereof to treat this because you're replacing the missing hormone. That makes great sense. Teriparatide was never approved for this indication, so if you want to use it, it's off-label for sure. And at the cost of teriparatide these days, hypopara patients usually have to take 20 micrograms two or three times a day, the, if the once a day is running right now about 36,000, you figure twice or three times a day, that's going to be a, a slightly bigger bill than you anticipated. And because it's off-label, insurance most often refuses to pay, even if it's life-saving, and you're sort of stuck. And the patient either takes it or doesn't and limps along until NAPPAR is back on the market. PTH has been given by pumps by Karen Weiner at the NIH in both adults and children, very famous for those studies. PTH has been given by an implantable microchip, and it works. 
not yet developed completely for market, but it, it's been shown to work. There's other parathyroid hormone analogs at this meeting. There's a company called Ascendus from Denmark. It's got a what's called Transcon PTH that's a long-acting PTH that slowly releases with a single daily injection, and it avoids the kinetics of the peaks and troughs of PTH that otherwise occur with either Netpara or teriparatide. Um, there's a company in Japan, Chugai Pharmaceuticals, that's developing a small molecule agonist that stimulates the PTH1 receptor like PTH, but it's not PTH. So this is, you know, you know, if you're interested in basic science, I mean, this is amazing. You can develop a molecule to stimulate a receptor to produce effects that are, you know, causing health benefit, and it's not even PTH, and it doesn't look like PTH, but it binds to the receptor, okay? Um, maybe similar in some ways to SERMs binding to estrogen receptors. When they came out, that was revolutionary because in the history of the world, we never knew that more than one molecule would bind to one receptor. The classic model is one hormone, one receptor, like one enzyme, one substrate, same thing, but we're finding that even PTH receptors can interact with other things. The calcium sensing receptor, by the way, if you ever follow that literature, that now is thought to be a nutrient sensor because it senses amino acids, it senses phosphorus, magnesium, calcium, yes, which is what it was initially reported to do, but then a whole lot of other things. And you know, the concept of a nutrient sensor makes sense, obviously, because your body will sense what you're eating and absorbing, but maybe this one, the calcium sensing receptor, has turned out to not just be a calcium sensing receptor. It's misnamed, actually. Nobody's proposed a name change yet, but that may come. Stem cell therapy has been used by Julie Sosa, who is, was at Duke, now is at UCSF. She's their chair of endocrine surgery, and she was able to develop um, induced pluripotent stem cells that got to the stage where they could make parafibromin, which is a molecule co-secreted with parathyroid hormone, but not parathyroid hormone. So that's yet to come, and of course, the way the FDA approval process goes for that, it's gonna take a while. But the thought is you can take skin biopsies, induce pluripotent stem cells, um, re-differentiate them into parathyroid tissue that's autologous and not have to use immunosuppression, which gets around the big issue of the last option, which you think, why would we ever do that? Is it that serious? Well, I can tell you, I've got a patient that we gave teriparatide and NAPARA to, and she responded well, but then another physician in another state took her off it. She went back to crashing about five times a day. Paramedics were visiting her parents' house five nights a week to bring her in to give her IV calcium and magnesium because she would crash so fast, and no matter what she did for conventional therapy, it didn't work. She came up to me at a patient association meeting about a year after I sort of lost contact with her, looking completely normal, and I said, you know, what has happened? What are you doing? What are you on? And she goes, well, my brother gave me a parathyroid gland. And she found a surgeon willing to do a transplant, and she was on immunosuppressive therapy like a renal transplant, but she was completely normal and had not seized or had crashes for about eight months. I have not seen her since, so it's not clear what the long term is, but the issue is immunosuppressive you know, uh, medicines have got long-term side effects, and of course they're not approved for this indication yet, and insurance generally won't pay for them. So, but that is a situation where I, even in the last six months, I've seen two patients from different states that are so severely affected, they're gonna die if we don't do something, and they did not respond to pump therapy, they did not respond to teriparatide or NAPARA. So there are these patients like that that I think, honestly, if we don't have stem cell therapy as an option yet, transplant is the only way to go. And you, know, you can't find surgeons in your local community willing to do this, and even if you talk to your transplant surgeons at your institutions, most often they're gonna say, why are we doing this again? Because there's no enthusiasm for it and there's no protocols written for it either. So this is coming and you know, it may solve some problems. The only thing we have right now medically to treat is PTH184. And again, the uh, phase three clinical trial published uh, 2013 in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology. It's a double blind placebo controlled phase three multinational study to get 134 patients randomized two to one for drug to placebo, and then followed for six months. Dr. Bilizikian, Dr. Manstadt, myself, and a few other people around here at this meeting were all involved in this, and it worked great. It met the triple end point they wanted, reducing calcium and active vitamin D doses by 50%, but maintaining calcium in the normal range, and that's never been done in the history of the world until this point, and it worked in about 53% of patients versus 2% of patients in placebo. Adverse events were what you'd kind of expect, but no different between the groups. And then of course the conclusion was it worked and it seemed to be efficacious.
This shows graphically from the paper what they saw in the treatment arms, and this is the uh, patients, number of patients, percentage of patients that are met the uh, primary endpoint, three, three things they had to qualify for to meet that, and about 53% of patients met it at the end of the six-month trial. And then, of course, the second curve looks at independence of active vitamin D and reduction in oral calcium. That was able to be achieved in about, I think it was like 43% of the trial population versus placebo. So as a result of this one clinical trial, not requiring two clinical trials like the FDA does for many things, they approved this actually on January 24, 2015, and this followed advisory board approval followed by a delay because they wanted further information. So we've had this since January 2015. It's been on the market since April 2015. This recall happened you know, roughly in August of 2019. So um, no problems before that. We'll see how it goes in the future. So to summarize, hypoparathyroidism, it's rare, but it's caused by surgery in most cases. It's got other acquired causes, including autoimmunity and genetic causes. Magnesium deficiency can be a concurrent finding. Um, the genetic causes are thought to be rare, most often associated either with isolated hypopara or syndromic forms. And of course, treatment options are what we've talked about. PTH was approved as adjunctive therapy only in the case where conventional therapy doesn't work. And of course, you say, how intense do you have to be with conventional therapy? Well, if it's in, in the hands of somebody who's got time and effort to do this, um, you know, three to six months is probably a reasonable trial period. And if it doesn't work at the end of that, you know, in our book, we would say they qualify for a trial of this. So you can think about that. So to wrap up parathyroid disorders, we've said a lot of things about two major conditions. There really isn't any other major conditions that, that affect parathyroid glands in a way that we think of anyway. And so the issue is, you know, all of us need to be conversant with these things. You know, terminology is hard enough, but sometimes, you know, we've never seen a patient like that or we're not used to hearing those things from patients. Um, so you have to kind of learn this on your own. Um, the parathyroid disorders are generally treatable and surgical um, intervention is recommended generally for primary hyperpara if they're symptomatic or they meet criteria. And then new therapies are gonna be available for hypoparathyroidism as we go. So my last slide here is just to show you where I work. This is the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic building is this marble building over here. These other buildings were added on later. This is a parking structure. The endocrine floor is that floor right there on that side and that uh, level on the same level. The endocrine bone group is on the other side of the building, but um, this is where we practice and work. This is where we see all of our patients. If you guys ever come to visit or to attend a course in Rochester, whatever, you know, feel free to let us know you're coming and we'll you know, make an effort to meet you and take you around a bit and show you things. But this is um, one great institution, I've got to say, you know, for having worked there and, and having a lot of friends and colleagues from this meeting mostly at other institutions, every institution is great. They've got great people. They're limited usually, like we all are, by the resources we have. And many groups don't have very, you know, many calcium people. We've got eight in our practice out of 46 total endocrinologists because we have so much bone and calcium disease that it's a full-time practice. And I don't see anything much anymore except for now bone and calcium problems. A lot of hypopara, but the other things too. That's not real life for most people we know, but this is one place where you can get some expertise if you need it. There's a lot of other centers around too. And, including our mentor out front, uh, Dr. Bill Azikian, who's very well known for this topic area, including, I, I think I heard him say this once before, that his first words as a baby were <laughs> parathyroid hormone, I think he said. <laughs> Hard to believe, but that's what he said. All right, so any questions you guys have you know, about these things or related things or clinic questions or research questions, um, to my knowledge, you know, People always ask, and it's true for osteoporosis, true for this condition, can I change my nutrition in some way that will affect this and make it easier or better? And if you think about that calcium sensing receptor being a nutrient receptor, I'd say there's no evidence to my knowledge that's been published that showing eating certain things or certain diets would modulate this condition, but it wouldn't surprise me if somewhere along the way that gets reported because you know, the key thing that we think is really important for this whole system is that calcium sensing receptor if it, if it senses other things too, and you play your cards right, in a sense, you could modulate this because of the effects on the parathyroid cells that are sensing that calcium sensing receptor or nutrient receptor changes. So any questions or thoughts?
This is a long day for you guys. You guys are probably exhausted by now. And you've got posters coming up. Are we on time, as far as I know? 5.45, so I think we're right on time. You guys need a, a short break, I'm sure, before you start presenting posters at 6, they said. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. If you have interest in this, I mean, hopefully they, we answered certain things and gave you some ideas about other things. But it's still an active area of research. And if you come to ASBMR in the future, there's in the poster sessions what they call the Parathyroid Canyon, where all the posters up and down this aisle are all parathyroid posters. And of course, you meet everybody in the world who's doing parathyroid research in about five minutes. And if you want to meet those people, that's where you find them because they're all there and they're fellows and you know all that. Well, listen, I hope you enjoy the meeting. And if you're able to stay for ASBMR, it's a lot of information. You got to pick and choose what you want to do because you can't attend everything. People oftentimes go home saying it felt like I was drinking out of a fire hydrant because it was so much so fast, but you focus on the things you care about and you learn what you need and hopefully it helps your uh, practice and research at the same time. All right, and good luck.